Okay, cold open. I want to tell a story that starts 40,000 years ago when a bunch of people in Australia got together and built a system of fishing traps in a river. That has been in use for 40,000 years until Europeans showed up. It's believed to be the oldest remaining human structure, human built structure. Around the same time, our other ancestors in Europe and Asia were painting inside of caves. A lot of animals, of course, but not all the animals that were in any place, but a lot of these like negative hand stencils. Can I have a little less up front? Thanks. Um, and we did this massive time and space away from each other. There's, there's no way that we could have been giving each other the idea to spray pigment across our hand. It's almost like to be human is to selfie from the very start. Many thousands of years later, skipping over a ton of human achievement and accomplishment. A bunch of humans, some number of humans got together and stood megalithic rocks up on end into a circle doing a bit of early astronomy. It's called Stonehenge, of course. Uh, around the same time, the pharaohs in Egypt forced countless enslaved people to build the Great Pyramids and the Sphinx. 3,000 years ago, in a near a place in England that's now called Uffington, because of course, a place in England is called Uffington. People who, we don't know the origin story of this. They dug, they, they built this minimalist land art that's about the size of a American football field or a soccer pitch or a football pitch, uh, because language. And that's filled with uh, chalk rock from a nearby quarry. And if we look really close, sort of like the lower lumbar of this, probably horse, maybe dog. Those are people, so that'll give you the scale. And then 1,400 years ago, something different happened in Japan. A shrine was built next to a shrine as an exact duplicate of the one that was already there. And then they tore down the old one. This is a process and a practice that's been repeated every 20 years since. And then about a thousand years ago in uh, Iran, some people built windmills in a particularly windy place, and they've remained in use ever since. I think since I made this talk, there might be like a government's uh, development plan that tore them down. But thousands of, for a thousand years, these windmills worked to power their things. Uh, so if you just came to see the cave paintings and horsey land art, that's it. You're free to go. Thank you for attending my TED talk. But I think this has some things to teach us about how to build um, better engineering organizations. But first, some business in the front. Uh, my name is Shane Becker. I look like this on the internet. Uh, I have aphantasia, which means I can't see things in my mind. I have ADHD, which means the stuff you know about ADHD, and um, I am autistic. Uh, some people call that neurospicy. Maybe you are too. You're not alone. You're not broken. Whoa. Uh, I have an incredible team that accepts me and supports me and celebrates me for who I am, and I'm like super grateful for them my managers and skip levels and the whole company is really great to me for that. Uh, I go by Vegan Straight Edge on most places on the internet, but not Twitter anymore because no comment. And so you can find me on Mastodon as uh, Vegan Straight Edge at ruby.social, where a lot of us are. Um, in 2005, shortly before doing this wobbly handstand at Four Corners, um, I watched the now infamous, famous build a blog in 15 minutes screencast and saw three things that blew my mind, changed my life, and I've been using every day since. Ruby, Rails, and TextMate, my favorite editor. Um, a few years later in 2009, I impromptu got on stage at GoGoRuko, Go Golden Gate RubyConf. Uh, Kobe was also in the back of the room then and filmed it, and, gave, and I stood on stage and gave my first talk. And uh, I had hated public speaking before that, and I was like, oh, I get it. I'm with my peers. They laughed at my jokes. I'm here for it. A decade later was the last time I was up on stage, as it were, at RailsConf Minneapolis. And uh, I realized while making this, like, holy shit, that was a decade span where like, this community changed this important thing in my life. And then March 2020, right? Um, I had plans to, of all things, go on tour with Rage Against the Machine and like, table like, anarchist books. And that all changed. 
you know, we've all lost so much. And some of these times were the worst of times. And uh, it was hard on all of us. It was hard on me. The, the isolation and aloneness that I felt during the worst of times is the most isolated I've ever felt. And there were people in my life during these times, and those people mean the world to me. Um, and now I'm here with you all. And it feels like a kind of coming home, but um, you can never go home again because I'm different, this is different. Something, something, embrace change. But it's good to be here. And uh, my friend Jim is sitting right here. He encouraged me to submit this talk and get back into this. It's been a long time. So we're almost done with the business, almost back to the story. I live in Portland, Oregon. Um, I'm a staff engineer, formerly an engineering manager uh, for a company that's based in San Francisco, California. That is a hybrid of remote and local. Some people in the office, a lot of us are remote. And currently, for the past four years, I've worked at, this is the place, we're called Hover. Um, it is not the domain registrar. The website is Hover.2, or TO. Um, only in the past two months, I've started taking ADHD meds, and they dehydrate me. So I'll be drinking a lot. Um, what we do, at the core of what we do, is use our apps to take uh, photos of a house, and through the magic of computer vision and machine learning, we turn those into uh, 3D models with really uh, detailed measurements, labels, textures, and um, those are used by like homeowners, uh, like roofing, windows, contractors, insurance company, tree falls in your house, etc. cetera. Uh, here's some examples. These are all rendered um, of the same house in different styles. Okay. Uh, we use, of course, a bunch of Rails apps, uh, we have a handful of front ends in the various front endy things, but a lot of that's migrating over to ERB views and uh, sprinkling in some stimulus and hot wire where it makes sense. And on the 3D side, we just use whatever works. Like we are not um, strongly opinionated there. And of course, we're hiring uh, for all levels of full stack and especially Rails developers. Okay, so if you're interested, talk to me after. My business card's here. You can email me or go to our uh, websites. And if you are watching this in the future, hello, how's the future? We're still hiring. Um, okay, so, um, you know, like I've worked at tiny companies, like, like three person startups and like, you know, companies that would fit in this room and even like super megalocorps with our friends, Aaron Patterson. And anecdote, of course, is not the, pl the singular of data, but I've been around a few blocks a few times. My experience is mine, your mileage does vary. Um, so today's talk will be observations I've made over the past couple decades making software, mostly for other people, and um, for the past, most of those two decades, doing it with Rails. I always love in like uh, program guides or magazines when there's a page that says this. Okay, so enough of the business, let's get back to our story. I feel like I'm on time. Okay, so sometimes when we humans build things that last for a long time, they last for a long time on their own, usually because they are built of rock or in rock, right? So the cave paintings are inside of rock. Stonehenge pyramids are rock themselves. But a lot of, a lot of the times that we build something and it lasts, it's because the continued maintenance of many people over many human lifetimes, right? The white horse of Uffington, it's gone in 20 years if people don't come back every single year and refill it. And the way they do that is they go to a, a nearby chalk quarry, I don't know, a place where there is chalk rock, and they haul it over and they break it by hand with hammers. And this has been happening for 3,000 years. We don't even know who made it. We don't even know that it's definitely a horse. It might be a dog, it's so like abstract. And we don't even know the people that it came from. But just that we keep doing it is reason to keep doing it. All right, so here's the pivot. How do we go from materials and maintenance in history, in long history, to making a world-class engineering organization? And I'm already tired of saying world-class engineering organization. It's a lot of syllables. So I'm just gonna say world-class engorg most of the time and just like make a mental alias. The rest of the talk will be structured as these questions, some of which are very small and easy, so I'm just gonna blast through them. And then the last two are the real guts of the matter and that's the most like tactical and railsy kind of stuff you could take home. So when, you should, when should you do it? Right fucking now. Always 
don't wait, don't ever give up, that one's easy. Where should you do it? Everywhere. It, I don't care what part of the company you work in, uh, make your place better, it's contagious. Uh, why should you do it? Because why the fuck not, right? That should be alone, a uh, reason alone, but let's go from like mediocre to good to great to totally fucking amazing because if we, if we engineering don't like advocate for ourselves, for our own needs, product and design and business isn't gonna do it for us. And because through the ravages of time, entropy only moves in one direction, right? We can't stop changing the air filters in our houses and our cars. We can't stop you know, maintaining and improving our software. It always decays. And because we all will die, right? We only have this one life in 100 years. No one will remember us. So nothing matters, right? But uh, it's, it's true, but th there's a, a kind of like, you know, 13 year old interpretation of nothing matters, like spiky hair, punk rock, anarchism. But I believe that optimism is a strategy for building a better future. Because if you don't believe that a better future is possible, you won't step up to make that better future a reality. Right? If you believe that there is no hope, if you assume that there's no hope, you guarantee that there's no hope. And that's true in our lives, in our like politics and social justice and all those things, in our relationships. It's definitely true in our jobs, in our these relationships. Um, because a lot of us in this industry in general, in this room in particular, have a lot of power and privilege. Some of us more so. And the least we could do is use that power and privilege to make our lives better and the lives of, of people around us better, including the people who aren't around us yet, our future teammates, the, the sort of te teammates one degree removed. After I'm gone, you join the company. I can still do things that will make your experience better. Because it feels good to ship, right? And it feels especially good to ship easy things when they're easy. And the trick is most things are easy things. You know, most of what we do most of the time is like forms and web pages, right? There's only hard stuff when we've made decisions to make, make it like foot gun complexity hard stuff. And oh yeah, it's good for business. Because a great engineering organization makes a great product organization possible, and the opposite is not true. Okay? That's, that's the thing for me. That said, I've worked with incredible, intelligent, empathetic, amazing product managers and designers. They're you know, worth it. When you find them, hold on to those partners. You know, the ones that get that it's the full package that makes us work when we are uh, working against the problem together rather than against each other. All right, so who? Who should make this? Who do you need to make this? The 10X programmer, ninja, superstar, all those stupid words from 10 years ago, they're all bullshit. Anyone in this room can do it. Anyone watching this video can do it. It doesn't take it, like I said, most of it is not hard problems. It takes people with shared values and enacting those shared values. All people are different people. All people are, are capable of everything I'm proposing and describing today. It also works for all sizes of companies. Like I said, I've worked for startups. It works there. Pardon me. Um, the, the current company I'm at is like 300-ish people, about 100-ish engineering. It works for us. It can work at AT&T or Google or whatever. It can also work for not companies, nonprofits, collectives, federations, networks, open source. And like I said, most things are not capital H hard computer science problems. Most of what we do most of the time is unremarkable. Um, we try to make it remarkable to keep the day-to-day -day fun, but a proposal I have is like, let's make the unremarkable unremarkable so that we can focus on the remarkable being remarkable. You know, let's not use JavaScript for all of the things. Let's only use JavaScript for Google Maps, something that you could only do with JavaScript in the browser, that kind of thing. It's mostly us, right? It's mostly about the people and our relationships and how we um, arrange the work in our lives together. Problems, problems, problems. But that's okay. We like problem solving, right? This is why we're in this job. We're good at this. And finally, like, we can't go this alone. Like, no great endeavor in engineering or in our lives we can do alone. We have to go together. Um, some long ago anarchists said this. I believe that 
my individual liberation depends on our collective liberation. I also believe that about this. But I also think that this is a useful uh, sort of framework to think about our lives and our work. So let's um, repurpose it for this. So I believe my individual engineering experience depends on our collective engineering experience. I can't be the only one refactoring if no one else is refactoring, right? Working together. These caves across tens of thousands of years and tens of thousands of miles were not painted by one person, right? Stonehenge was not stood up by one person. This thing was not dug out and refilled for 3,000 years by one person, right? We go together or not at all. So what even am I talking about? What is this thing? What is a world-class engineering organization? I think, I don't know, quick show of hands. We're, we're not going to do a lot of like audience participation. Who here just kind of has like a hunch, like your own sort of definition in your mind? Like you don't have to say what it is, but just like, okay. For the video, that was like 10% of the room. Um, so like Coach Lasso said about the offsides rule in football soccer, uh, I'll know it when I see it, which is uh, a little bit hand wavy and um, shirking responsibility of someone who has uh, your attention and time in this public address system. But I, I gave this talk internally at the company a couple years ago, and I've been searching for a kind of like pithy way to say like what an, a world-class Endorg is. And what I've come around to is that it's less of a noun. It's not something to be. It's more of like an adjective. It's a way to be. So like what is a world-class engineering organization? It's a place that does world-class engineering organization things, which, you know, uh, isn't fair. Um, but, okay, so here's a different way to think about it. There was this book published in the 70s, I want to say. Uh, it was one of three. The other two were A Timeless Way of Building and A Pattern Language. Those books went on to shape Kent Beck and Ward Cunningham and The Gang of Four and that whole wiki, and that's why we have the idea of software patterns. This was a book that described uh, what we now call agile software development, but about building buildings. And then Ward and uh, Kent Beck and others read these and were like, oh, that works for software too. So one of the things they describe is organic order. The idea of organic order is that the whole system cannot be designed or built itself. The whole can only be expressed as a collection of all of the local acts and parts. So a forest doesn't exist on its own. A forest is the collection of all of the trees and all of the life there together. And it's not just the trees, right? Because a tree farm is different than a forest. So a forest exists because of that organic order. And so that was a lot of hand wavy dancing around the answer. Here's a kind of short bumper stickery one. It's always the people, right? It's always about the people. Most things in our lives is about our interactions and relationships with each other. So those relationships and combined, uh, the people and relationships combined make our culture. And our culture is a, um, our values and action, and our, that action expresses our priorities. So if we don't know what our priorities are, we need to write down principles to guide those actions, to express those priorities. And when we write them down, we need to keep them small and memorable because uh, what is Google's mission statement right now? Who the fuck knows? This is what it used to be, right? We all, they, they turned out to, they, they ended this and they removed the N apostrophe T, of course, and then they added a bunch of just bullshit jargon, but it was short and memorable, right? We all knew that. And so here's one that's a little bit closer to home. This is what Matt's, this is his like design principle for the whole language, to optimize for our ha happiness. Pardon me. Matt's design principle for Ruby is to optimize for our happiness. And so when we write these things down, it becomes this shared artifact that we can all point to when we're deciding a path forward. Right? It eliminates a bunch of those like, this is my opinion, this is your opinion at this moment. Whose opinion is loudest or hierarchy or whatever. And it bears worth saying, again, still, because it is still true and it still matters that diverse teams are better teams. It is the good and right and ethical and just thing to do, but also it's good for business. It's been shown many times in many studies and 
many places over and over that diverse teams are better for business. So a world-class engineering organization can't be full of people that look like me or teams that look like me. And like I said before, this doesn't require any like, you, you can't, you don't just need, you don't have to just hire people that are like PhDs or principal engineers or staff engineers, right? All levels can and should contribute to this thing. Teaching hospitals are, um, uh, in all measurable ways, the best hospitals. The lowest mortality rate, the lowest failure rate, all that stuff. Because something about having a mixture of levels uh, decreases ego, increases listening and learning, and the act of us teaching makes us better at what we already know and do. Okay, so I don't know. Uh, up here, I feel like I'm talking like a chipmunk. Am I talking super fast, y'all? Okay. Thank you for that. This is how I like to present, um, probably because I have ADHD. I, I watch all videos at 2x because I'm like, talk faster, people. But so I try to be what I want, want to watch. Um, also, we're after lunch, so I'm trying to cuss a lot and move fast to keep you awake. All right, so, so the how that is left, this is all the really tactical stuff. This is where the photos in the background stop because I don't want to distract for, from the words. The words are the thing that matters. There will, the video will be up. You don't have to memorize all these um, or any of them. And I will make a website. I bought the domain, but I didn't get done in time, worldclassinjord.com. Okay. So everything so far has been abstract and generic and could really be applied to any kind of organization. So this is the stuff that is the beginning of an engineering organization. Okay, so let's finally get into these principles and tactics that apply to engineering. This, if you only take one thing, please don't only take one thing, but if you only take one thing, it is this. Ask any of my coworkers, any of my like friends and peers, I say this shit all the fucking time. Everything is better when we do it in small chunks. Small methods, small classes, right? We always talk about that. But also small deploys, small PR, small change sets. You know, I love looking at a PR that has one character change or one line change. I, it's, a lot, it's so much easier for me to hold all of that in my head. Okay? Um, it also means that the rollback, if we fuck up on that deploy, is much easier. The surface area, the blast radius is much smaller. If something goes wrong, we affect our customers less. Make small moves. Next, whatever your default branch is, master or main or whatever, of any production software, that repo's default branch should be deployable at any time. If I have the, this sort of hot take, strong opinion that if the test suite in CI for your default branch for main uh, is at any time not passing, even if that's deployed, treat that like an incident like a SEV1, P0, whatever you call your incidents, when the website is down, we can't make money anymore, treat this with the same severity because you can't do business if you can't ship software, right? We are in the business of change. And if something goes wrong, if a customer reports a bug and we want to fix it, but CI is broken, we can't ship the, the fix, right? So keep everything deployable all the time. Um, and like I said, like we can't stop changing the air filters in our houses and once you buy a house, you just, keep, you just keep discovering new things that have air filters that need to be changed. Um, there is no super to call. Um, we can't stop changing the oil in our car. We can't wait for some, like, like, we can't wait for the end of the race to do a pit stop. Also, no one will ever give us permission to refactor. We have to do this on our own. This is part of the job. It is not a separate thing. It's not a way to pad stories with, like, story points. This is how we do the work. We make the change easy, then we make the easy change. That's a Kent Beck quote and idea. I didn't come up with that. But I, I live by that. Everything we do on my team is we make the change easy, then we make the easy change. And that middle step, that might be hard, but it makes the second step way easy. All right, so do it all the time. But separate that from the behavioral changes, right? All of you have probably experienced looking at a big PR. To me, a big PR is like more than like six files. Like we've gotten like, not dogmatic, but like, uh, intense about this. Like we keep our PRs really small. And when someone comes in from outside the team that comes with a big one, we say, okay, let's work together. Let's chop it up into sensible chunks. And by separating the refactoring work, and going back to like Martin Fowler's definition of refactoring, refactoring is changing the internal arrangement of our code, of our software, without changing the external behavior. 
right? So nothing changes for the customer when we move from Postgres to MySQL. Don't do that. But you know, like when we upgrade um, a factory girl or factory bot, nothing changes for the customer, right? That's a refactoring. It is not fixing a bug. It is not you know performance upgrades, all those things. Like, but separate behavior from refactoring, and it will change the mode that your PR reviewers can be in. If it's a refactor, if it's just a structural change, then I can look at the mechanics of the language. How does this code feel to me? And I don't have to think about, will this break? Right? I could be in a different mode. Is this uh, satisfying our goals as a business? Uh, this community is already sort of baked into the idea of conventions. Like that's like Rails principle number two after optimized for developer happiness, borrowed from Ruby. But Rails is conventions over configuration. Right? We all know that since the first Rails thing we ever did. And uh, I want to encourage you to follow the conventions as macro as possible. Right? So if there is like a web scale convention, right? a default browser behavior, HTML behavior, stuff like that, follow those conventions first. And then if something's different in our language, Ruby, do that. If something's different in our framework, Rails, do that. So on, so on, so on. If you're, if you're following team conventions that um, deviate from the more macro conventions, think really hard about those. Is it worth it? What is the onboarding cost for new people? What is the uh, sort of like tribal knowledge, like shared mental knowledge of that different convention? Is it documented? The cost of that documentation, documentation staying up to date? It's probably not worth it. We are mostly not unique and beautiful snowflakes. Um, next, name concepts, not the people that we are currently paying money to, and not the software pattern. So what I mean by that is don't have a class called um, flipper, um, uh, flipper adapter, or no, sorry. Don't, don't create a class called like rescue job. Create a class called background job because you will change rescue to sidekick, right? You will change flipper to split IO, and you will change split IO to launch darkly for your feature flags. Name the concept, name it feature flag, not who are we paying this month. Because once we put that brand name all through our code base, it is such a pain in the ass to change, which accidentally creates this kind of technical lock-in. Well, let's move from this company to that company because we like this feature. It's gonna take us a month to do that. Well. We can't fit that into the roadmap. Oh shit, we have to redo our contract. We're baked in. Also, naming the software pattern or the programming pattern into a method or a class means that if you change the implementation of that method or class, the outside name is still the old thing. You either have to go and change that everywhere, its references, or you have to let it tell a lie. And again, uh, we go together or not at all. Pair programming is good. Pair, like group PR review is good. Like cross team collaboration is good. Uh, no shame, who here does not have automated tests? That's okay. That is great. Like that's what, one of the things I love about the Ruby and Rails community is like from the start, thanks to like people like Chad Fowler and stuff, like and Dave Thomas and then like Testing is just like baked into the DNA of this culture, this community. So the thing I would add to that is, it's one thing to be able to run, you know, bundle exec RSpec. It's another to have CI, right, where it runs on every time you push to a branch. You know, that's the next level. Uh, make sure you're doing that because, like the hard drive sitting on my desk, not plugged into my laptop, I don't do those backups very often, right? Any chore that is a manual step, we won't do it often enough, and we won't do it well enough. Writing is a superpower, right? Writing is like teleportation, it's time travel, it's telepathy, it's good for uh, ourselves to like, you know, articulate our thoughts, it's good for future us. I love looking up a problem and the answer was written by me in my past. Uh, it's good for our peers, our future peers, and the peers who won't, we won't over, overlap with. Uh, we can't be in every conversation all of the time. Um, Managers try. I tried as a manager. It doesn't work, uh, even with Calendar and Jenga. But early is the cheapest place to affect change. So if it's just a bad idea, right, like a, a feature that's not going to work well, or um, the way it's imagined will be really difficult to implement. Once a like PR, like a, a product PRD. What's that stand for? Product rec whatever. The the sort of product version of a tech spec. I'm blanking on the acronym. Uh, or, or once like 
design has done like paintings of websites that are pixel perfect, it is so hard to undo that work and do it, take a different approach. Uh, ethical concerns are much more expensive once we've shipped it to a customer, once it's made it to like testing and like the further along it is, the harder it is to affect change. So imagine engineering was more involved at the start of a feature with our product and design partners and did it at the like lo-fi, like uh, low quality sketch level. So on a whiteboard together, Sharpie on paper, whatever, where the changes aren't free, right? But once it becomes sort of like closer to etched in the pixel, it's harder to affect that change. So begin early. Uh, along with participate early, uh, participate in your like teammates onboarding early. If they've made it through the interview, they've proven whatever, that they're a good enough whatever programmer to be here. Don't let them feel like they have to like rush to like shipping their first PR. Their first job and your first job as them onboarding is to acclimate them to a team, you know, for them to become a good teammate. There will be forever to ship good PR, so participate in your teammates onboarding too. Um, this one's the clumsiestly written one. I apologize for that. I don't know how to say it better, but security and accessibility are table stakes. They can't be afterthoughts. Shift left. Do them earlier. Um, resiliency is also super important. Uh, circuit breaker pattern, feature flags, things like that. Like, uh, don't assume that our software will always work because it doesn't always work. Everything always fails. Uh, enable and empower such gross mealy mouth words, but again, I couldn't find a better one within some like reasonable uh, boundaries or like uh, within some reasonable expectations and with some guardrails in place like CI and uh, PR review and rollbacks all that. Allow people like to just bias toward action. We get these fleeting moments of like inspiration and excitement that the more we talk about it and plan it and prioritize it and put in a roadmap, it just, the work will still get done, but it won't be exciting, right? It won't be inspiring. So it, it enable, create situations and environments where people can chase that inspiration. Uh, what I mean by migrations is not database schema changes. I mean, moving from one system to another, one approach to another, 80% is good enough for an MVP of a feature or a product. It is not good enough when you're moving from Postgres or MySQL to Postgres. It's not good enough when you're moving from AWS to GCP. It's not good enough when you're moving from rescue to sidekick. You finish the thing or you have two things and now you have probably not just double the problems but like square of the problems. Finish migrations, they are anchors that you are dragging around forever. Uh, and then finally, we improve what we measure. We tend to measure things like revenue, active users, uptime, but what are the measurements that we could use that rewards someone or encourages the work, incentivizes the work to upgrade Rails, to upgrade Ruby, right? to like fix that flaky test. What are those measurements? And then how can we reward someone other than saying, great job, Shane, we appreciate the upgrade. Right? Like core system maintenance cannot depend on like shadow work, personal project, you know, passion project kind of thing. This building right here, like imagine if uh, the lights staying on, like or lights turning on, just like depended on someone who was like interested in that. Right? We laugh because it's like so obviously like absurd, right? But that's how we run software organizations. All right. So finally, that's all stuff about engineering software in general. This stuff is about Rails, and I'm going to break it into sort of three sections with the 11 minutes left. The first one is conventions, more about that. And like I said, follow the most macro convention you can. Um, same is true with like RuboCop and stuff, and, or standard, or whatever. Use like, deviate from the community at large as little as possible, not to be like a Borg in the machine, but because it makes onboarding easier. It makes, it's like, it's good for retention, it's good for hiring. You don't have, if you've homegrown something, you are the only ones who know about it, and you are the only ones who have documentation, if at all. So follow conventions. There are valid reasons for micro or macro services. I'm not uh, dogmatic about that. I'm not trying to rehash 2014. But there are huge benefits to a monolith. 
everyone, plenty of people have said them, but I will add this to the stew of conversation about monoliths or not, is when we have a microservice thing over here, nine, time, nine times out of 10, 10, 90% of the time, um, it, it is a microservice over here because it was someone's pet project or some, a way to placate someone because they were unhappy on a team. Go make a new thing. That person leaves. This thing is now abandoned. Monoliths don't get abandoned because we all live in them. And we all work in them. Uh, just use Rails views. Like, stop using JavaScript for everything that's a simple web page, right? Um, I, I'm sorry, that was like more uh, whatever uh, aggressive that I meant. Um, most things are web pages. Most things are not Google Maps. Let's keep it simple and conventional, especially ERB, not Hamel or Slim, because the uh, onboarding costs are higher for those for people coming from not Rails, even people within Rails. It's all a whole new syntax, whereas ERB is just HTML. HTML is like the lingua franca of our epoch. Uh, and then when you need it, you know, sprinkle in a little bit of JavaScript. Like I said, we use Stimulus and Hotwire and Turbo, um, or Hotwire is all of those. But even, honestly, it's like some vanilla JavaScript or some like jQuery blob just on one page, because that one page needs a little hider show dingus or like an Ajax submit. Even that's better than uh, bulldozing the whole thing and using React to make like one form have a doodle flop. Okay. Uh, organizationally, everywhere that we can reduce the friction of the individual's life and experience and the act of making software, the happier we make us, right? And, and Happy us is good for business us, that, all that stuff. So a way to reduce friction is use boring technology, right? Like uh, Linux isn't new and exciting anymore, but it powers the whole fucking web, right? Because it's resilient and works, right? Same with Rails. Rails isn't like the new shiny anymore, uh, but that's great because like it's totally reliable. It pays all of our salaries and our mortgages and rents and stuff. So it's good that Rails is boring that way because boring technology fails in predictable ways. New shiny fails in unpredictable ways. Uh, what I mean by this, or integrating first party tools is if you're already using GitHub for your code, which most of us are most of the time, then there's a lot of um, friction reducing uh, benefits to using like first party GitHub issues projects or uh, I don't care if it's GitHub or not, but like just everywhere you can, do not use Jira. It is it's like the, the worst piece of software ever. Um, but like use like so using Jira or you're already using Confluence. I wouldn't say go use Jira because first party because it's so bad. But if the other first party thing is otherwise good, integrate with it. Um, overwhelmingly, don't uh, reinvent the wheel just to put your own tire on. But if no one's building your tire, go build that tire. Right? So we made a little like YAML wrapper gym because we were doing the same like four lines of YAML every time we did, or four lines to read YAML every time we did something. So we just rolled up into a little gym. We use it across the company. It's open source. Uh, where do we put files is mostly uh, like a, a solved problem in Rails, it tells us. But app and lib is like the open debate. Here's my contribution to that. Uh, app is for all things about our business, including the app models folder does not have to just be active record backed files. It does not have to be model database table. You can put plain Ruby objects in there that are about our business rules. Lib is for everything that's upstreamable, every generic subdomain that you could extract to a gem, pull requests an existing gem, uh, pull requests the framework of the language. Uh, make tests go fast, everything gets better. What I think of fast is for like a large mature Rails app, less than five minutes whole deal in from like push to results. So that's not just run time, that's build time, all of it. And parallelize the shit out of it. Like I'm like 40 or 50, you know, note, test node runners. Uh, we use Knapsack Pro for that. You can use whatever. Uh, uh, you know, get to latest version on Ruby, Rails, Gems, your system dependencies hidden inside of your Docker files. Get latest on all of that stuff, your, your databases, all that, and then stay there, stay latest because that makes every upgrade small, right? Just make small moves. Those small, small upgrades are easy, um, and when they break, you know what broke. It was when we went from 141 to 142, right? Small change. And then automate that. We use Dependabot for those changes, and we are, we're subscribed to like 
the Ruby mailing list so we see upgrades. Thank you. Um, make developer setup so easy, like minutes, whether that's scripts to rule them all, uh, Docker, dev container, uh, code spaces, whatever it is, so that you get these like drive-by contributions from other teams. And those one-time contributions often turn into re re repeat contributors if that process was easy. Thank you. Um, use linters, like let's stop debating about the wrong things and not just for Ruby code and JavaScript code, but also Markdown and YAML, all the things. Hey, come on in. Uh, finally, it's about the people, right? So let's support the people. Um, a big part of what a lot of us who love Ruby love about Ruby is that it's pretty. I think the top one, HTTP, no, HTTP, you can read. This tells me exactly what it's doing. And the second one, I don't know. Right? It's not obvious to me. I know it now because of you know, 15 years of uh, exposure therapy. But So bias towards like more expressive code. Use gems for that. Use interfaces for that. Write your own more expressive code. Sometimes creating an antonym method instead of using bang other method makes it more expressive or readable. Um, and use the inflections that are B file to tell it about acronyms so that you can name your classes the way that we would write them, not the way that the, like, the autoloader expects them. Uh, and again, name things what they are, um, not nicknames, not code names, not who we pay at the moment. I talked about this earlier. So name it feature flag, not flipper class, launch darkly class. Uh, we made a little wrapper gem uh, when we migrated from flipper to split that supported both of those and abstracted that away. So Everywhere in our code, we don't say split dot this. We say this feature dot flag enabled. So that in some feature when we switch, our internal code doesn't change, just our adapter. Telemetry or something like that for like um, outgoing events. We have found over and over when everyone owns something, no one owns it. So make sure we have clear definition of who owns it and give that team the like, I don't like this framing, but this works authority with that responsibility. The ability to reject PRs, request changes, that would otherwise cause like friction there. Um, and then imagine this uh, building not having an on-site maintenance staff. Right? It's fucking absurd. A company of a certain size, which I would say like the people in this room is big enough, needs to have a dedicated team. It could be two people, but if that's all they're doing, they could do a good job of it. Uh, Get and then defend 20% time. And it, we've found that it works best if it's a specific day that we all do it together, not like you have 20% in your schedule, good luck finding it in little chunks between meetings. So we, we do a thing called Excellent Fridays. Total autonomy, do something around programming in your job, don't go build a canoe. So where do we go from here? These are the things. Um, so I want you all, if any of this has resonated with you, to go back to your jobs and homes and think about ways where uh, you could replace a blob of jQuery with some stimulus. Right? You could use the better materials in our sort of sense. You could do an upgrade of a gem or the language or the framework. Um, you could delete dead code because no code is better than no code. You could find ways for yourself and Importantly, for your teammates to have more time to do this kind of work, and you can find ways to do it together, right? Because we don't, we won't succeed alone. This is the four things, right? Materials, maintenance, time together. Uh, and then, if you do any of these things, if this, you know, 45 minutes has given you any excitement or whatever, uh, let me know about it. I'll mass it on here, or you can email me here. And like I said about like inspiration and excitement, like. If you're here with a, a coworker or teammate, like make a plot and a plan right now and do it today or on the plane or first day back at work because like it, the, the high of opium fades as we leave the poppy field. Uh, and then if you have a hard time getting started or convincing your teammates or your company, I'm available for hire as a contractor on this or a consultant on this for one week only. Sorry, the offer isn't for one week. I'm available to come to you for one week, remotely or in person. I've got an official approval from my employer. Uh, come talk to me if that would help. To basically sort of tell the same stuff, but as an outsider expert to your people to help be convincing. 
Okay, so that's the end of the talk. I want to acknowledge a few people that have, because like no ideas live in a vacuum, everything is a remix. Matt Fong is the best teammate coworker I've ever had. Uh, the idea and the specific words, all uh, world-class engineering org, come from our ongoing conversations about everything. Uh, I've been inspired and um, affected by so many people that I couldn't list or describe, but I just wanted to put these names uh, out there publicly. These people hugely shaped um, like how I got to where I am today and given this talk. And finally, if uh, the cave painting stuff excites you at all, John Green has a podcast in the book where he tells a story about it and there's a video with Kurzgesagt, I never can say it well, but the animated uh, education channel that he narrates. It's super great. It's about a specific cave in France. And then finally, if you want to change everything, start anywhere. And the secret is to begin. So I thank you for your time and attention. I love you.